Good morning, and welcome to Our Bible. This is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, and we come together once again in this virtual setting to praise God and to lift our hearts in worship. We like to continue to remember Vicki Gaines in our prayers as she has had surgery this week. Continue to think of her ahead and um, hope the best for her recovery. So let's take this time to prepare our hearts and minds for the worship. Thank mm -hmm. you. You created us for your 
yourself, so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant to us such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will and no weakness from doing it. In your light, may we see life clearly and in your service find perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us unite our voices in song as we sing it together our opening.
21, verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produce the fruit of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've always had a deep fondness for texts that speak of the foundation that Christ is. It goes back to my youth to, of course, the roots and music of those songs that I could not hum now but spoke about the house that was built on solid rock, the house that was built on sand. Those kind of texts that speak about our grounding in Christ have always been important to me. I've always brought back fond memories and have grounded my theology. It made me have a deep understanding of how we relate to Christ and the support that he is to all time. This parable is a little different. Although the foundation, the cornerstone is mentioned, it has a different sort of feel to it than some of the others. It's different than when Jesus talks about Peter being the rock upon which his church will be built. It has a different air, a different tension within it. Part of that comes from where it falls in the gospel. Jesus has just arrived in Jerusalem, Matthew 21. This parable takes place shortly after Palm Sunday, after the cleansing of the temple. Jesus' audience different than some of the other places in the Gospels. He's not only talking to his disciples. He's not only talking to a crowd of people who want to hear his message or eager to hear, such as when he was preaching his Sermon on the Mount. No, Jesus is in Jerusalem and he's around the temple. The Pharisees and the scribes are gathered around and Jesus is to them, speaking about them. Sure, his disciples might have been here, but there is a, a building tension in this text in where Jesus is in his ministry. Jesus is being prophetic. All of his movements are facing and pointing him towards what it will happen in a few short days. He is in the midst of Holy Week. It's no coincidence that when he ends this parable, 
the Pharisees once again, once again, are at a place where they don't care for the message he is bringing. They are trying to figure out ways to get rid of Jesus. It is a powerful parable. God, the owner, comes and plants a vineyard. He turns the vineyard over to tenants who are entrusted to care for it. He's not to give it to them. He's not relinquished ownership of the vineyard, but he assigns people to take care of it. And when it comes time for harvest, he sends his servants to go and do that work. And when they arrive, the tenants who have been tending to it, who have been living there, who have been a part of this vineyard, want nothing to do with giving up what they believe is theirs. So they enact violence upon those that God has sent. More workers arrive. More servants sent to harvest the fruit to bring home the goods that the vineyard has grown. The cycle repeats. Violence is enacted upon those who come to do God's work. Eventually, the sun is sent. Not only is the violence enacted once again upon the sun, but there is even even thoughts of knowing who this is. It is no accident. They name that this is the heir. If we kill him, we will get the inheritance. The son is killed as well. It is no coincidence that the Pharisees piece this together. No coincidence that they understand who Jesus is talking about. This parable is not, does not need to be explained to the Pharisees, and the high priests, and those who are attending to Jesus at this time. The people of God, the Pharisees, and those who crucified Jesus, did not do the work that they were supposed to do. The people of God did not see Jesus as one who is there to save, but as one who is there to destroy all the things that they held dear. This prophetic Jesus is troubling. He doesn't heal, he disrupts. He doesn't feed he overturns the systems of the day. He stands in the midst of the temple and says, this is not right. If the one who heals and performs miracles is problematic to the powers that be, how much more so is this Jesus who now stands before them? The one who is threatening their way of life. The one who is saying the way that they are worshiping and understanding their relationship with God is wrong. Couple that with what we know in chapter 25 when Jesus speaks of the judgment of the nations with sheep and goats and those caring for him and not caring for him. And we find a Jesus which is challenging even for us to deal with it. This is a Jesus that demands action. This is a Jesus who wants us to be involved with the world and not sitting back. This is a Jesus who's not interested in feeding us, but interested in us feeding others. This prophetic Jesus is troubling even to us today. So how do we deal with that? What do we do with this Jesus who seems to be so different than the one before? What do we do with this Jesus who asks uh, more of us than he might be willing to give? I'm glad you asked. First, we need to understand that no matter where we approach Jesus, we need to be in right relationship with God. Before we even begin to comprehend what Jesus requires,
requires of us, we need to understand the necessity of Jesus in our life. We need to understand for us to be in right relationship with God, we need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is a personal aspect to our relationship with God that is necessary for us to even begin to answer the questions of why this prophetic Jesus in Matthew 21 challenges us so. So first, we need to make sure that our personal piety, if you want to speak of John Wesley, that our personal piety is working right. We need to know that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that we have been forgiven. But once you move past this, our second step is we need to make sure that we do the work that Jesus does. Matthew preaches this over and over again from the Sermon on the Mount to the, the last moments in chapter 25 when he talks about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the prisoner, caring for the sick. That this work that Jesus does throughout his ministry is the work that we are called to do. That what Jesus does in the Gospels is the imperative for what focuses our ministry here and now. That includes the work that Jesus does in this passage. Of standing up to injustice, of taking stands that are unpopular, of being able to speak truth to power. That work is included as well. Number three, that we need to understand that our foundation resides in the church. When we delve into Pauline theology, we see that the body of Christ is reformed in the church. And our foundation for ministry resides in places such as Audubon. And then we need to move past the challenges that that brings to the table. We need to move past the challenges of virtual worship. Then we need to move past the challenges of denominational polity. We need to move past the challenges of apathy to the work of the church. Then we need to understand that our foundation for all of our ministry resides in the church first and foremost, and then it blossoms out from there. Last, but definitely not least. And I mentioned it a minute ago, but I want to reinforce that. That we must be the prophetic voice that Jesus is as well. That we cannot sit by when things are not right in the world. That we must be that voice that calls for rights to be the wrongs to be right. We must be that voice that asks difficult questions of those in power and authority. We must be that voice that risks everything to fight for justice. Christ's response to the Pharisees is quoting a song as this is the cornerstone that was rejected by the builders. Christ is that cornerstone. He turns the idea of the cornerstone a little differently in this text. He says, this is the cornerstone that you will break upon if you fall. This is the cornerstone that will crush you if it falls upon you. It reminds us that our relationship with Christ is not one that we can have from afar. It's not one that we can distance ourselves from, but it is one that we must be firmly grounded upon. That when your feet are firmly planted upon the rock that is Christ, 
you will not be. It will not break you when you fall. Then it must be grounded in the essence of who Christ was and continues to be. We must build our foundation upon Christ. It cannot be someone we encounter occasionally from a distance. We must be rooted in Christ Jesus. This is our work. This is what we are called to do. This is who we are. It is okay when we read parables like this for us to be troubled. It is okay for us to not quite grasp all that Jesus calls us to. It is okay for us to struggle and finding our voice when it's required. It is okay for us to have moments where we don't quite get all that Christ wants us to do. But we cannot. We cannot remove ourselves from the rock that is Jesus Christ. That we must build our foundation upon that cornerstone. That we must Remember where we stand. So in the tumultuous times that we live in, this, this wonderful 2020 that we are experiencing together, we must remember that even though we are in a part, even though that our spirits yearn to be together in ways that we were in the past, even though we might feel distant from things that we hold dear, even in those days, we must continue to remind ourselves that our feet are still and will continually need to be rooted and grounded in the rock that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Father, the Son.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for who you are. We bless your name this day. We give you all of our adoration, all of our praise, all of our attention. We honor you and you alone, Lord God, for you are worthy. We thank you, God, for all the ways that you have blessed our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, for your provision. We thank you, God, for your healing work in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have made shalom possible, that in your body you have tore down the dividing wall of hostility creating space for people who are different to become one with one another. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Lord, we know we often fall short from living in the ways that you have called us to live. We forget who you are. We forget who we are. And so we pause for a few moments to reflect on our lives with you this week and to confess to you the ways in which we have not been the people that you have called us to be. Hear our hearts, hear our confessions to you in these moments. God, we thank you for moments like this to pause, to reflect, to consider our ways in the light of your love. And we thank you that in you is forgiveness of sins. In you, we can exchange our unrighteous deeds, our unrighteous acts for your righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been declared righteous, that we are the righteousness of Christ, that we are in right standing with God the Father. We thank you for our position as sons and daughters of the King. We remember who we are and all that that means in these moments, that we are blessed, that we are highly favored that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are free. We align ourselves with the truth about who you say that we are. And we thank you, God. We thank you for making us who we are today. We thank you for the relationship that we have with you. We thank you for the life-giving ways that you bless us, that you speak into our lives. We thank you that by your grace, we can learn a posture of listening, listening to you, Holy Spirit, listening to your gentle promptings as you lead us and guide us in the ways to go. We thank you, Lord, for your wisdom. We lay aside what we think we know and we listen for you, Lord Jesus. As we worship with you with undivided devotion, we believe that you will speak, that you will prompt, that you will lead us, that you will guide us, that you will give us the direction that we long for. Lord, many of our hearts hold heaviness and weight because of the trials that are around us, the trials that we face within us. Lord, we remember those who are sick, who are recovering from surgery. We remember those with difficult and scary diagnosis. God, we remember those who are uncertain about the future. Lord, we lift up to you those who are struggling with finances, those who are struggling with anxiety and fear, those who are feeling different from other people, those who don't feel like they fit in, those who feel like they don't have a voice. God, we remember people today who are on the outside, who are, the mar who are on the margins, Lord. 
We remember those who are oppressed because of the color of their skin. We remember those who are oppressed because of their views of what they think or where they live. Lord, we're in such a polarized culture right now and we need your help. We need you to give us a heart of love for all people. We need you to give us the grace to forgive when we are offended. Lord, in all of these needs, we ask for your healing. We ask for your peace, for your grace and for your mercy. We ask for comfort, direction. Lord, we hide ourselves under the shadow of your wings. You are our ultimate protector. protector. You are our ultimate peace. So Lord, we thank you that we can come to you with all things, that we take our masks off with you, that we can bear our souls, that you hear us and that you want to speak back to us. Lord, we thank you for the connection we have with our brothers and sisters in the Virginia Annual Conference of the Methodist Church. We thank you, God, for our bishop. We ask that you would bless her and give her strength as she continues to lead us and we thank you for her work on racial justice and reconciliation and the prayer that she has given us to pray. So we say together, O oh, loving God, we give you thanks for creating the world which is full of diversity and for making one human family of all the peoples of the earth. You reign over all the nations and are seated on your holy throne. You rule over all the peoples without partiality and respect to nations or races because righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Forgive us for the times when we put walls around us with false pride and racial prejudice. Forgive us the times when we were silent in the face of racism, private or institutional. Open our eyes to see Christ, who is in people of every nation and every culture. Break down the walls that separate us. Set us free from fear, hatred, and racism. Bind us together with the unity of God's love. Restore oneness to the family of God. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
freed you from falling, to make you stand without blemish in the presence of God's glory with rejoicing. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and glory for all time.